I've been looking at my watch here, and it's still one minute to go. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> and it's a great, great honor to present for you as a goal, uh, for today's presentation, The Rise of Longevity. I've been given the task of introducing you, and that entitled me to, to read through your CV, and I am not able to give it full credit because it's so long and impressive, but I'll just briefly tell you that, that Professor Walby is educated at Harvard Business School and at UC from Howard University, and he has held a number of, of positions, but the most important and current ones are that he was the founding director, director of the Max Planck Institute for Demography, um, or demographic research in Germany, and uh, that was in 1996. And then in 2013, he also became the director of the Max Planck Odense Center on the Biodemography of Aging. He also currently holds a research professorship at Duke University um, and is uh, having a number of other positions of which I, I was really impressed to see that you're also at the same time the director of the European Doctoral School of Demography and of the International uh, Max Planck Research School for Demography. And in addition to all these uh, things, <laughs> Professor Hobble is an honorary doctor at Newcastle and London and received a number of very prestigious prizes, uh, among which were the European Nazis Prize, uh, awarded by the European Science Foundation as researcher of the year 2011, uh, and recently the Corsarelli Cor Prize, which is awarded by the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And, uh, and these awards uh, lead very well to today's presentation because they were given for research on aging and lifespan, and it was given for Professor Hobel's profound influence on demographic research. So it's with the greatest respect and the greatest expectations that I introduce Professor Hobel today. Thank you very much. Well, I can tell Nikolai my honor degree in Lund is in economics. <laughs> Happy to hear that. Yeah. Okay. So, so the the. Uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, talk for 25 minutes or so about the rise of longevity. And I'll, I'll start with some theory, three theories of longevity. Why do we live as long as we do? And uh, like, the first theory is there's a fixed frontier of survival that, that everybody is born with a maximum lifespan. You can't live beyond the maximum lifespan if you're 40. And this idea started like most ideas with Aristotle. <laughs> Either Aristotle or Plato, right? This is from Aristotle. So Aristotle, 350 BC, wrote a couple of essays on the shortness and longness of life, and he developed a theory of life. Not only human, but other species of human. And his basic idea uh, was that life is like a fire. You're born with a fire. This is the for you. And the fire burns down. And eventually the wood is all gone, and you die. And you can't live longer than the amount of wood you have. But he based this actually on some very serious thinking and uh, evolutionary thinking in 350 BC. And that his, he, had, he developed a physiology of longevity, or a biology of normal aging. And uh, his basic notion was that there was a trade off between maintaining your body and reproducing. The more energy you spent maintaining your body, the less energy you had in resources you had in production. And this basic idea of 350 BC was followed up in the second part of the 20th century by a number of well-known biologists, uh, and they, they had basically the same idea. That, uh, I'll just read it to you, as, as individuals grow older, more and more of their reproductive output is in the past. So when somebody is 45 years old, that person is likely to have fewer children than the person 15 years old. And uh, hence the force of Darwinian selection uh, declined because that there's only a force to the extent you have a normal reproduction. And the, so reproduction at younger ages is favored over maintenance of the body. So Aristotle's idea, but done up in modern 20th century biology. And, the, and Williams, the, well, Meadow I developed this, and Williams followed up on it, but it, it was actually Hamilton, more than anybody else, who really developed the notion. He, he took these ideas and put them in mathematical form. Hamilton was a very good biologist who studied demography at London School of Economics, and he used his demography to put this theory in, in, the formal, uh, in terms of formal mathematics. And then Tom Kirkwood also followed by this. So here's uh, Hamilton, William Hamilton. And he wrote an essay in 1966, and then he came back to it in 1996 and commented on his mathematical proof. And he says, 
I show that no life schedule, even under the most benign ecology imaginable, could escape my spectrum of forces of life. What a proud man. <laughs> and uh, he said that, just lots of juicy quotes, but senescence is inevitable even in the furthest reaches of the most bizarre universe. How about that? Huh? Okay. So, so we all grow old, every species. And because of that, he didn't think there was anything he could do about aging. He thought aging was completely determined by this fundamental biological trade-off between reproduction and maintenance. That was completely biologically determined. And that to live a little longer, you'd have to have a few hundred years of draconian uh, eugenic measures. Right? He wrote this in 1996. And then, because of this, he said, all money spent on aging research is wasted. <laughs> research on extension of active life seems to be comparable to the alchemist's search <laughs> and detracts from both unavoidable truth and for realistic social programs. He didn't believe in nursing homes. And he didn't believe in kind of help over. And uh, he's a famous biologist. Probably the greatest biological theorist of the second half of the 20th century. So, um, that's theory one. We know now which one. But, but there's, there are still people who stop this theory, maybe a lot of biologists, a lot of uh, actuaries. Uh, I'm going to go to the United States next week and give a talk in which I'm going to debate someone who still believes this. Uh, theory two. Yeah. There, everybody has a maximum lifespan, unless you know the secret. <laughs> if you know the secret, you can live long. Okay, so what's the secret? This is from the first book about this was by Luigi Canaro, so I'm not sure he's familiar with this, and uh, The Art of Living Long. And he uh, was a Venetian nobleman. He published his book in 1540, and so far as we can tell, he claimed his age was 56, and as far as we can tell from the limited records, he was probably 56. What do you think his secret was? Olive oil. <laughs> no, no, I don't, no, 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 Dietary restriction. We're still doing work on dietary restriction. <laughs> Severe dietary restriction. He claimed that he lived on one egg, a scrap of bread, and a glass of wine per day. Like most people who know the secret of longevity, he's a liar. Right? But, but anyway, but, uh, he, he, uh, I'll show you he's a liar. So he came up with the second edition of the book. 17 years later, and any demographer knows if you're 56, 17 years later, you're 73. But he was 80. <laughs> His diet made life a scene. And then just before he died, he published his third edition. He was 81, but he claimed to be. <laughs> so, okay. Now, the, is there a secret of what we have? A lot of people with book names, and we've spent a lot of time in epidemiology and biodemography work. And now let me tell you what, the, what I know about this. This is based on lots of research, although it's not surprising. The, the average lifespan in a population, so how long you live depends on the population you're living in. And if, if you're living in, in some poor country or two or three centuries ago, people didn't live very long, and your lifespan was mainly determined by the conditions in the country. The conditions of the population. But given any population life expectancy, there's some variation. Some people live longer, other people live short, but a lot shorter. So is there a secret to, given the fact that you live in Denmark today, is there some secret you can use <coughs> to live longer than you can live? Yeah. Well, we've done a lot of work using the Danish twin registry, and we've discovered that using, looking at uh, identical twins and fraternal twins, that about 25% of the variation in the length of life of adults is due to genetic variation. So, so genes matter a little bit, 25%. And we've done a lot of work trying to find these genes. The trouble is there are hundreds of them. And the biggest one so far accounts for less than 1%, <coughs> much less than 1%. So there's lots and lots of genes 
And if you're lucky, they add up brightly. If you're unlucky, they don't add up. They interact with each other. So it's very, very complicated. Then a lot of people think that uh, the environment in utero and early childhood environment, childhood environment generally, is important. Uh, it accounts for about 10% of the variation. Uh, and this has been replicated in lots of other studies, but we published the first here. And so two thirds of the determinants of how long you're going to live is your adult life. And it's your whole adult life, like smoking, drinking. It's also what you did yesterday, where you live right now. <coughs> so, oops. Well, I was supposed to show, it didn't come through, but that was a picture of clean air and clean water. <laughs> so the, the idea is that my advice to you is live a place with clean air and clean water close to a good hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I live in Canada. <laughs> it's an ideal place. So, but, and then you can living in Kedamina, what can you do? Uh, well, when it's cold, dress warm. Uh, people in London and Paris don't realize this. There's a lot of men die because of this. Uh, the, the death rate uh, among younger men in, uh, in London and Paris is <coughs> in the winter is higher than the death rate in St. Petersburg because people don't dress warm. The, get a good night's sleep, eat a balanced diet, we don't know what kind of town style <laughs> Anything as long as it's lots of different kinds of stuff. And uh, have a nice social life, family life, get some exercise, get outside. That's it. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, this is what you shouldn't do. <laughs> by far the most important, by far, you shouldn't excess drinkers. So, what's the bottom line? What's the secret of longevity? Listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. So, uh, we haven't found, I mean, we're doing a lot of work, and people here in this room are working on this, but it, this is the basic point. Uh, now, the, the third theory, which I actually uh, wrote about in 1979, was that uh, <coughs> people are actually living longer and longer. The, the frontier of longevity is actually being advanced or being pushed back. But we don't realize this because we don't have good enough data. And in 1979, when I wrote this article, uh, there was no country in the world that published mortality data after age 85. And most countries stopped at 80. So we just didn't know. <coughs> didn't know what was happening after 85. And uh, so people claimed that no progress was being made in bringing death rates down to the highest ages. But nobody had information about this. My hypothesis was that we were making progress. So what do you do? I'm giving you a clue to you. What, what do you do when you need good demographic information? You go to Stockholm, right? You go, and, and you go, I talked with Hans Lewis, <coughs> this is Sweden. And he took me down to the basement of this Sweden, and he showed me all these records. And he's, uh, all these records here. And, the, and here's a particular record. So anyway, by year, by age, by the year you were born, the current year, by age, by sex, how many people were alive and how many people died all the way up to the highest ages. It just it was not computerized after age 85. So, so I raised a little bit of money, and uh, Hans Lundstrom spent vacations and evenings and weekends for three and a half years computerizing the data. So finally, we had information. And here's what we found. So the risk of death on the vertical axis in the year and uh, to begin with, we went back to, he went back to 1900, and later he went back to 1861, and he didn't really. And to begin with, he went up to 1988. But we've since extended. So here's age 85. Uh, and the, the, uh, this is for females, Swedish females. But you can see that up until 1950, Aristotle was right. But after 1950, there was a really dramatic decline to the problem of death being cut in half. And then here's at age 90. Again, a dramatic reduction. And, and then here's at age 95. A lot of noise because you weren't very 95 year old Swedes, but still a dramatic reduction in age 90. So it was, at least for Sweden, Aristotle was right in 1950, but Aristotle was wrong after 1950, and it was not true that nothing could be done about it. 
So then we replicated this for a bunch of other countries. Uh, we did that work here, actually. Uh, and uh, I'll just give you one example. This is German women and German men. I could show you lots of other countries in Denmark. But this is just a case <coughs> that the, and it starts in 1950. The after 1950 has been dramatically improved in the United States. And then, when I should like <coughs> done some work on the rise of the explosion of centenarians. So here, here's Swedes, 100 years old and older, so centenarians Swedes. And you can see, and, and the Swedish data, the good data started in 1861. You can see very, very few. And they picked the year hardly any. And then whoop. So the, uh, in 1860, there were five centenarians in Sweden. And the 2010, last year I have data, there were almost 1,400. So a real explosion. Now, I'll show you something even more impressive. The rise in Japanese women who are 105 years old or old. These are called super centenarians are 110. So these are semi super centenarians. <laughs> OK, so here, ah, oh, why is that blocked out? Anyway, it's, I don't know why, but it's zero, and it goes vertical. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so 1973, there were 12, and then uh, 2010, 2016. So just a really remarkable device. OK, so, so what do we know about uh, human longevity? First, what I just showed you was the frontier of survival is advancing. The old age mortality is not intractable. That was a big discovery. The, there's a major supplemental discovery, and that is that this advance is <coughs> a postponement of high levels of mortality to older ages, rather than slowing down the rate at which mortality increases. So we're not growing older more slowly. We're growing older later. Anyway. And uh, you can see that, again, this is German data. Okay. So mortality on a lot of scale, age 50 to 80. And this is the uh, women in Germany. And this is the men. And on a lot of scale, mortality goes up more or less linearly. And you can see there's roughly a shift uh, for men and women. But the, the sort of convergence of the high stages. The, the men are at higher mortality. And then if you look at uh, more recent data, so men and women in 2014, you can see the female curve shifts over mm -hmm. and the male curve shifts over. And just to give you a concrete illustration, let's take age 65 and then age 65 here, age 55 in the earlier curve corresponds to age 65 in the more recent curve. And then the same thing for men. So basically, 65 is the new 55. <laughs> And uh, I can show you some other examples. 75 is the new 65, and so on. So but there's been a shift, of course. Uh, and the, uh, so, <coughs> another important discovery that we worked on here is that life expectancy is rising linearly. And there's no sign of a lunar limit. So uh, this is work I did with Jim Burton. And the, so we have, 1840 to the present, age 45, age 95, life expectancy. And this is life expectancy for the population doing the best. It's always women. <laughs> but to begin with, it was Sweden. And Sweden in 1840 had life expectancy just over, Swedish women had life expectancy just over 45. And then there were a series of other countries. And then recently there was Japan. And you can see it's Linear. Very linear. What's the slope? It's two and a half years per decade. Three months per year. <laughs> Six hours per day. <laughs> so it's really amazing. For over this 175 year period. Now, any particular country like Denmark or Germany or France uh, has a more complicated pattern. This is the best. So here, just to give you one example, Germany, Germans sometimes complain about the 21st century, but they should complain about the 20th century. <laughs> because uh, there's Germany. So in 1900, Germany had the same life expectancy that Sweden had in 1840. Progress, World War I, Spanish flu. Progress, World War II, 
progress, but no memory of the disasters, and in, in recent years being two or three years behind the record. This is true for many countries. Okay. There was an article in Nature, uh, Dr. Canfield and I discussed whether it was the worst article ever published in Nature. He, he thinks there were even, some that were even worse. But the, 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 it was a really dead article. It was, it was published last uh, October that uh, there was a maximum to human life speed. The maximum length of time a person could live. And it was 115. And the, uh, the longest, well verified lifespan is Jean Camon, who lived 122.5. But she was an outlier, and the maximum was 115. Okay. So anyway, so we uh, we got some data, and we looked since 1955 at the uh, age of the world's oldest person. So this person became the <coughs> record holder in, in 1956 and kept the record for several years, and then died. And then this person became the record holder and died. This person had a very short time. <laughs> Here we have the first man. The second man, there were only six men in this whole record that ever held the record over other record holders the group. This is Jean-Louis Camon, who Ajun and I met, and she was the record holder for this whole time. Amazing, huh? And then she died. And so if you put a regression line through the age at which a person becomes the record holder, that's what the pink line is, that line is going up at one and a half months per year. So it's not three months per year, it's one and a half months per year. So it's not going up as fast as life expectancy, but it's going up, definitely going up. And uh, the, uh, one of the projects that we're going to be working on, some of the people here in the audience, the big, the corpus, is uh, to what extent is this increase in the record due to the fact that more and more people are living to hunger and they have survived at higher ages, and to what extent is there actually private screening in the And then, so, but if you take these numbers and you do some forecasts, so uh, we did forecasts for France, Germany, and Japan, and try to forecast the age at which 50% of the birth cohort is still alive. So if you look at the babies born in the year 2000, then in Japan, if you forecast based on this data I showed you, in Japan, half of them will still be alive in, at age 105. In the year 2105. In 2010, 2015. So, Denmark is like Germany, roughly. So, the, so very long, if, these four, you know, if, if the past progress continues, if the, what's happened for the last 175 years keeps on going, then very long lives are not the distant privilege of some remote future generation. Very long lives are the likely destiny of our children. Children of life today. Okay. So how are we going to get there? And there's been a number of things that have been proposed. So we're making progress against some diseases. A lot of work being done here. There's some progress in regeneration and rejuvenation of tissues. There's some progress in replacement of the genes. It's just starting, but it's coming. There's some development of nano robots. So tiny robots as big as a cell, you ingest a billion of them, and you go around and kill bad cancer cells and replace bones and materials. And then uh, maybe uh, there'll be some progress in slowing the rate of aging. Maybe due to the discovery of the genetic basis for the rate of aging, or maybe due to some medicine that you take. You know, eat tomatoes every morning. Or and we'll slow down the rate of aging. But this is in the future. But this is how we're likely to get to these very many really So we can get there. Now, uh, I don't have time to talk about this today because it would take a whole other lecture, but uh, we've done a lot of work here on the healthy span of life. And I'll continue to do that, including some people in the audience. And uh, it's a very mixed picture, depending on which country you look at, what disease you look at, what condition you look at. But generally, uh, the bottom line is that if you measure health as being able to live by yourself, live independently, not being in a nursing home, you can get out of bed by yourself and feed yourself. Mm -hmm. Then the health span of life is increasing. Maybe you have a pacemaker, maybe you have an artificial hip, but you can still live by yourself. Um, and the really good news <laughs> is, uh, for many of us here, our brain is our favorite organ. And the, the, the uh, <coughs> good news is that cognitive ability is improving. 
and that cognitive disability is being postponed to higher ages. So that the uh, recent evidence that Linda Einfeld uh, published in the shared data is that uh, we're postponing severe cognitive impairment at more than three months a year, greater than two months. So the period of life, the end of life when you're demented is getting shorter. And there's other studies that back this up, but it's, it's complicated. But it's basically to be positive. So, recently, uh, the paper that we published in PNAS that won the award as the best oracle uh, showed that uh, life expectancy rises in lockstep with life span equality. So, that as we're living longer, we're, li we're dying at more similar ages. Older ages, more similar ages. So, let me show you some data. So, the, the uh, first, I'm going to show you a quick picture of the history of human longevity, and I'll give you some further data. So, the annual probability of death on a lock scale against age. And this is for hunter-gatherers. Mm -hmm. And for hunter-gatherers, the minimum level of mortality is just over 1% per year, close to 2% per year. And it's higher, and goes down, it's pretty stable, and goes up in the ages. So what, what's happened since the hunter-gatherers? Well, it turns out the hunter-gatherers and Swedes in 1750 had roughly similar <laughs> distributions of lifespans. But here, here's the Swedish data. And uh, Sweden from 1750 to 2010, I'll go back. Isn't this something? Well, this is on a lot of scale. So just astonishing progress uh, in, on, a, on a percentage basis at the younger ages, but even on an absolute basis, even at the highest ages. And uh, so we've transformed life so that the probability of death is now very small, and that most people die at older ages. So to dig deeper into this, uh, Nando Cochero and some other people here and I, uh, <coughs> studied 12 populations, so the uh, six non-human primates, and then three hunter-gatherers, and then 18th century Sweden, 21st century Sweden, and 21st century Sweden. And the, the, the curves here give the distribution of deaths, the ages of people, or individuals. Die. And the little insets uh, show how, what percentage of mortality is, is in infants in the first few years. So you can see there's been a remarkable change. And I'll show that more clearly to, in the next graph. So this is the, the, the glorious graph uh, in uh, Colchero, the old paper. The, the, uh, this gray line shows life expectancy versus a measure of life spending quality. It, it's a complicated measure, but it's basically a measure of how similar the ages are to which people die. So, in Liberia, 1820-1843, life expectancy was very, very low, uh, extremely low, just a few years. And uh, these were slaves, freed by wealthy Americans, shipped to Liberia to die. And, uh, and life span inequality was very high because almost everybody died, but a few people lived there. Then we go up, 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 and finally the top of Japan. And uh, <coughs> life expectancy now is. 87, and uh, as you can see, the and lifespan equality is much, much higher. Much, so the Japanese died much more similar ages. And then here are the primates, the non-human primates. And it's a different slope, but it's roughly a linear trend as well. Uh, so the the uh, but the human curve is really more. And uh, some people had thought that as we extend life, there was going to be an increase in inequality, and some people would benefit, other people would not benefit. Not true. Extending life uh, actually benefits the entire population in the sense that lifespan quality is increasing. And uh, so then we looked at 35,000 life tables. It's amazing when you're a demographer how many life tables there are. And the red line there and the yellow lines show the curve. So it's not quite linear. It's almost in the blue line is the theoretical maximum. But more interesting is down here, we looked at three populations that suffered crises so let's just take uh, the Ukraine. So the Ukraine, 1931, was doing pretty well. Then Stalin cut off food so that people start to starve mm -hmm. in 1932. 1933, life expectancy fell to 10. And there was a very high degree of inequality because a lot of young people died, but a few older people kept on living. <laughs> then 1934, the famine eased. In 1935, they were back to the norm. 
But see, it's straight to the same line. So we have this lockstep relationship between lifespan quality and health effects. And here is another example. This I'm doing with the, I have to say the names. Jose Manuel Abut. <laughs> Hugo Filippo Pasolini from Italy. Sean <laughs> Kiego, Denmark. <laughs> anyway, so we, uh, this is the kind of interdisciplinary multinational team we have. And uh, so life expectancy first differences, so life expectancy in one year minus life expectancy the previous year. And then lifespan equality one year minus lifespan equality the previous year. So it has changed in life expectancy, but change in the quality. And you can see it's not as perfect as before, but basically there's a strong correlation so that the life expectancy goes up, lifespan equality goes up, and life expectancy goes down, lifespan equality goes down. <coughs> it was causal. And uh, but what's causing what? And uh, to begin with, we were thinking about this, we're thinking about socioeconomic conditions. Yeah, that doesn't explain things that are happening from one year to the next, simultaneously. And then we were thinking, of, I was thinking, of, maybe there's something fundamentally physiological about our body so that there's some deep relationship between life expectancy and lifespan quality. It's simpler than that, actually, as my three co-authors pointed out to me. The, the, uh, if you save somebody's life before life expectancy, <coughs> let's say 80, for example, then you increase life expectancy, and you also increase lifespan quality. If you save somebody's life after life expectancy, you increase life expectancy, but you decrease lifespan quality. Okay? And uh, it turns out that the rise of life expectancy, uh, let me put a little time to step it turns out that about one third of deaths occur before life expectancy, about two thirds of deaths occur after life expectancy. So, so the rise in life expectancy has been fueled almost entirely by saving lives before life expectancy. And saving lives after life expectancy hasn't done very much, because these people don't live very much longer. And saving lives before life expectancy also increases life expectancy quality. So it's because of this relationship between uh, early death and the fact that society has been very good at saving lives early that, it, that produces this correlation between life and quality and life expectancy. Okay. I'm going to do two other topics. Humans are an extreme outlier. <laughs> Many of you may know that, but the, the, the uh, but senescence is not inevitable for all <coughs> Hamilton is just simply wrong. So, so we published a paper about this in Nature in 2014. And we looked at a bunch of different species. I'll show you this in a minute. And we looked at fertility patterns and okay, cross species. And the mammals, the primates, other mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, trees, plants. And uh, here's humans in the uh, recent. And uh, so one is the average level of mortality or the average level of fertility over the whole life. The blue curve gives the actual level of fertility compared to the average of the birth rate. And the red line gives the death rate, the level of mortality compared to the average. And you can see the humans Fertility is concentrated before age 50. And the, you can also see that mortality is very low up until 50. It's really quite low up until 70. And then it starts to go up rapidly. And at age 100, life expectancy is 20 times higher. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, mortality, not life, mortality. At age 100, mortality is 20 times higher than the average over the course of your life. So mortality it happens at younger ages, but it's rare. And then when you get to my age, it starts going up, and then it goes really goes up, and you get older. And, and uh, that's humans. Now this is Japanese women in 2009. This was Swedes born in 1881. This is hunter gatherers. This is chimpanzees. And uh, it's all the same basic pattern, but you can see this extreme <coughs> sharpness of the rise in mortality from modern humans. It's enormously extreme sharpness. And that's related to the fact that we die in similar ages. People don't die younger ages, but we all die in old age. 
How about other species? Well, this is the nematode womb. This is the only species we could find for which Hamilton was right. <laughs> uh, this is the species that's studied by lots of biologists. So, but anyway, fertility starts to decline after maturity, and mortality goes up steadily after maturity. <coughs> Here's some species that show negligible senescence. So, uh, this, is, this is a bird, the great tit. This is a hydra, a hermit crab, and so on. The mortality is pretty much flat over the course of life. The hydra, we just published a, about two years ago, we published a paper at BNES on hydra uh, based on hundreds of thousands of days of observation of hydra. And uh, we studied them for seven years, and hardly any hydra died. So uh, we estimated that the age at which 95% of our hydra would be dead was 1,400 years. <laughs> we stopped the experiment. <laughs> but anyway, it's, the, the, the mortality is really flat. For and then these species, uh, a couple of plants, and an oak tree, a, a tortoise, uh, mortality actually goes down with it. As the individual gets bigger, the individual is stronger, less subject to predation, and mortality goes down. Okay, so, so this is not inevitable for all species. So let, me, let me finally conclude by doing some political science. Uh, so that it seems to me that in the future we're going to work more years of our life, but fewer hours per week. Maybe not us, but the average. And the, 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 uh, so here, here's a chart. I don't have, I'll have Denmark in a minute, but now I, this is for some other countries. How many hours per week do people work? So I work part time in Germany. Germans work really hard. Wow, Germans work hard. How many hours per week per capita do Germans work? So that's, I want to make sure you understand this is per week, it is per capita, per, per person. Not per worker, but per person. 13. And that was a couple of years ago. In a few years, maybe down to 12 because of the Asian baby and the change we said was. And then for France, so the French work even less than the Germans. <laughs> the Italians work a little bit more, but still less than the Germans. The British work more than the Germans. And the Americans work even more. But still, 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 nobody works very hard. <laughs> it just seems like a lot of work because we concentrate the work in a few years of our life. We, we don't work until 25 or 30 and then we stop working at 60. This is what <coughs> so, uh, so let's take the concrete case of Denmark. Last year, or the year before last year, uh, Danes worked 3.8 billion hours. And there were 5.6 million people. So what I'm going to do now is political arithmetic. <laughs> <laughs> Division. So you divide one number into the other, and you get 13 hours per week per capita. Same as the Germans. How is that possible? Well, first of all, only 2.6 million of us worked at all. That's 47%. 53% didn't work at all. Zero. Some of them were babies, some of them were old people, some of them were unemployed, some of them were handicapped. Uh, but if you just take the 2.6 and divide it into the 3.8 billion hours, you get 20 hours <coughs> per week per worker. This is paid work, not real work. <laughs> but but, but <laughs> the, 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 the uh, doesn't count for breaks, doesn't count for lunch breaks. Okay. So anyway, how do we get down to 28? So the usual work week in Denmark, as everybody knows, is 37 hours how much we're supposed to. But we have vacations, five, six weeks. And then we have all these religious holidays. You can go to the church many times a year. And then we have sick leave, including sick leave for your kids. So that brings the 37 hours down to 31.5. And then some people work up. And that brings it down to 28. So that's how we get to 28. 
so, so my idea is it's time to redistribute work. So the, the 20th century was the century of the redistribution of income and wealth, making people have roughly the same income, roughly the same wealth. Now it's time to redistribute work. Too few of us are doing too much work. And too many of us are not working hard enough. So uh, 13 hours per week per capita. 2.6 million people work, for example. So this is review. The people who work, work 20 hours. Right? But so suppose 5% more Danes could work. So instead of 47%, it was 52%. Then you could reduce the work week to 25 hours. The official, I mean the actual work. And, uh, and the official work week could be reduced from 37 to 33 hours. Just by getting 85% <coughs> more people. I'm 72, very few 72-year-olds, but not us. But very few of us are still working. But if we can get more 60-year-olds and more 70-year-olds to work, we can reduce 5%. It's not very much, just 5%. We can reduce the work week to 33. And, uh, and of course, because of the actual amount of work, is much less because of vacation. <coughs> so this, I think, is the way of the future. And that older people should work more, and younger people should work less. <laughs> Okay, so my, my uh, younger people should have more time for their children, their families, tennis. Yeah. And we live longer and longer. We live healthier at any specific age. We postpone disability to later ages, including cognitive <coughs> We work, we will work more years of our lives. How can you retire at 60 or 65 when you don't live to 100? And uh, we'll work fewer hours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation, and I think uh, you said uh, 65 is the new 55. Yeah. I, I know your age from your CV, and yeah. I can reveal you're 72, and yeah. I think in, in your case we all think that 72 is more like 35. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have questions for President? So, uh, I pretty much bought your explanation for the correlation between what you call uh, age inequality yeah, yeah. and uh, correlation, but I was wondering if you tested it with some random data which really shouldn't be correlated at all to see if, if there's a problem with your measure? Yeah, so uh, what we did, uh, like, uh, this past summer I spent a lot of time running a grant proposal. But I had some time for research. So I, so I looked very carefully into the mathematics of, of how life expectancy changes when the mortality changes the mathematics of how the life quality changes when the mortality changes. And I looked on the equations, so if you have 1% change in uh, death rate and some age, how it will affect those two numbers. And uh, it turns out that uh, the two measures, if you, 1% reduction in death rates before life expectancy has a similar impact on both life expectancy and life quality. It's not exactly the same. Uh, the impact is very, very similar from 0 to 50, and less similar from 75. And then afterwards, it diverges because, say, the last half of life expectancy increases life rate. So uh, it increases life rate. You know, so, so partly it's a mathematical relationship. And uh, we uh, have looked at various species. What's going on? It is, uh, you don't have this strong lockstep relationship in the middle species. So it's not random data, but if you look at uh, some animals or some birds or some plants, you don't get this kind of relationship. So it's, it's something special for humans, and uh, this is a change if you have a species in different environments, what that happens. But the, so, the, so I don't think it's, I think it's true. I think it's real, not, not just some other. Um, this is not very related to what you have been talking about, but in popular media we often hear stories about uh, how certain diets lead to longer lives. Yeah. But these, again, these are popular stories with yeah. a very small cohort and yeah. so on. Yeah. Is there any solid data, maybe done on rats, mice, or even humans, mm -hmm. which show a clear correlation between certain types of diets, such yeah. as a Medi Mediterranean diet, yeah. and longer lives? So I, the, uh, there's very little solid evidence. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, I, I looked into this, and, and the, the, uh, 
the basic conclusion I could draw was that uh, as long as you have a balanced diet in the sense that you eat different kinds of things, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. So, but, and then you read all the time, you know, eat more almonds or eat, eat more walnuts or eat more tomatoes or uh, eat more fruit. Avocado. Eat, uh, avocados. <laughs> at least 375 grams of vegetables every day. That's a lot. And, uh, and, uh, but there's, I, uh, there's a lot of epidemiological studies, but, uh, but there's no, to my mind, no really solid evidence. And the, I'll give one example, one kind of total example. My wife's parents both died in their 90s. They spent their life eating this very simple diet. They had bread and cheese for breakfast. They had bread and maybe a little paste, and maybe cheese for lunch. They had a big helping of potatoes, this thick, dark gravy, and a tiny little fricadilla, and maybe a pickle <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> they lived in their 90s. <laughs> and, uh, so, and that's true for, so, anyway, so, the, uh, so I don't think this is a dietary so, so not even on experiments on worms and rats? Oh, sure, 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 sure. If, if you, uh, with nematode worms, if, uh, if you uh, change the diet, you can, they, 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 there are dietary changes that increase. Uh, and, uh, and caloric restriction <coughs> seems to increase lifespan for some species. There's no good evidence for humans. Mm. But for some species, mm. caloric restriction seems to work. Uh, but uh, the whole area of nutrition is very hard to study, and, and, and there's just been so many different results. You know, you read the paper one day, and it says, don't eat whatever it is. And then a week later, eat lots of <laughs> And uh, so I, I think we have to wait a few decades before we know more about that. Right? Thank you for a very good talk, uh, very wide-ranging as usual. Now, to, to what degree or with what degree of confidence can you say that the story you've given as the main lines of the story mm -hmm. are true of humans, as you claimed, yes. or instead of just rich humans in the post-war world? Oh, the, the, yeah. So, we, uh, we have good data, which, very good data, very <coughs> good data for Sweden back to 1861. We have usable data for Sweden back to 17, 1751. And then prior to 1751, this kind of sources of data. Uh, and uh, there's also, uh, we also have data from hunter gatherers. Of course, you know, the, they don't live under exactly the same circumstances that they used to live under, but we do have hunter gatherer data. And then we have data from skeletons, skeletal remains of people who died two, three, four, five, seven years ago. And, so the, we have a pretty good understanding of the, the rise of longevity. And, and we know, I can say we know with considerable confidence that up until 1840, life expectancy in the population was doing best, hovered around 30 to 40. And then the, the life expectancy in the countries doing worse hovered around 20 to 25. Up and, down. and even the, uh, the rich, you look at this data on noble people, kings and queens and barons and dukes and so on, and they had roughly the same death rate as what did they, not, they didn't have much noble life experience. And in fact, uh, Swedish data indicate that social class only became a major factor in determining uh, differences in lifespan, life expectancy after the 1930s. For the reason before the 1930s, there was very little difference between people in the lowest socioeconomic category and people in the highest. So, so we have a pretty good idea of that history. And uh, we have a pretty good idea, I showed you some data, that there's been this lockstep relationship between life expectancy and lifespan equality, even when life expectancy is very, very low. So we have data on some crisis populations like the Ukraine and Liberia. And this, this seems to hold. So the, but, the, but there was very little progress on average in the net, very little net progress up until 1840. And then life expectancy started to go up. Uh, it started to go up in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and Mecklenburg. OK, anyway, all here in the North Sea, uh, in the end of the world. And, uh, the, uh, and then other countries jumped on the bandwagon. And, and start, uh, Germany started in 1900. But then recently, for most, most developed countries, life expectancy was going up. 
So, so it's a fairly recent phenomenon, just the last couple of centuries. But we don't see any, don't see any leveling off. So nothing happened and grew up. So maybe nothing can happen in the future. But I don't know. But, uh, but there's no sign of any kind of leveling off. So uh, the there are people uh, who strongly disagree with me about the future of Wong Chow. And there, there are lots of people who think that we're not going to be able to increase lifespan much more. We're not going to be able to increase life expectancy much more. Um, and they may possibly be right. The, to, uh, to increase life expectancy in the future, we'll have to make some of the breakthroughs that I'm talking about. It's not clear whether we make those breakthroughs. Also, the uh, progress in bringing, I alluded to this, progress in bringing death rates down after age 100 is much slower, in fact, close to zero in some countries, uh, much slower than progress at younger ages. So maybe it's not possible to bring death rates down after age 100 by very much. So Claude Christensen has a major uh, grant proposal and he's prepared to focus on that. Uh, so uh, if life expectancy is going to go up to 100, we have to start bringing death rates down after 100, right? I, mean, I don't know whether we can do that. So there's some uncertainty about the future. I think the past is pretty long. So in that sense, what you're, you're, what you're mentioning about the future, how do you think is, why do you think it's so important to, to, to understand the evolution of aging in so, species, in so many species to inform about humans? Mm -hmm. For example, if we understand yeah. you know, other primates, yeah. and, and why it's so important that, that we keep that line of research? Yeah. I, I would like to, to hear it. Yeah. We work on that, yeah. and that's my passion, but I would like to hear it from you. This is Dalia Kandi, who a week ago submitted a paper to science, a very big paper, and it hasn't been rejected yet. <laughs> so, but anyway, the, 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 uh, the reason, that it's so, it, was so, it was so important to study evolutionary, uh, to study aging across different species and look at evolutionary theory, is because all of the evolutionary biologists, starting with Meadowar, and then George Williams, and then William Hamilton, and Tom Kirkwood, and, and all their people who uh, wrote with them, they all unanimously agreed that senescence was inevitable, that we could not bring death rates down at higher ages, that it was inevitably dictated by evolution, that there could be no progress from this at the higher ages. And they were wrong. Every single one of them was wrong. Uh, the, uh, I was at a meeting in Washington on the biology of aging, I think in the year 2001, 2002, and uh, they were, and I was supposed to be one of the commentators, and a bunch of people made presentations, and some people talked about rats. And some people talk about Drosophila and never talk about yeast. <coughs> Say old stuff, you know. And, the, 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 uh, and then Debbie Roach, a biologist at the University of Virginia, gave a paper on Plantago Mazzolata, which is a plant, a weed, a Johan Mose, and, and a broad leaf plant, right? Narrow leaf plant. Narrow leaf plant. Okay, narrow leaf plant. Narrow leaf plant. It's a weed. Boy Scouts eat it sometimes for lunch. And, the, 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 uh, and she found back then that death rates did not go up with age for this plant. And now we know it's more complicated. They go up and down. So, but, so I, I got up and said, wow. I mean, I've heard a lot of things that I've heard before. People are dotting I's and crossing T's. But finally, I heard something really interesting. There may be a species for which senescence is not inevitable. I was booed. <laughs> the first and only time in my life, the audience of 500 people, I was booed, hissed. And, uh, and the, the uh, I wouldn't mention their names, but I know them very well. <laughs> One guy stood up and said, there's no need to listen to a demographer. He doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and another guy stood up and said, Hamilton, W.D. Hamilton, 1966, proved that senescence was inevitable for all species. There's no need to listen to this joke. <sighs> so I had a new PhD student in Rostock. Her name was Aneta Bowdish. So you know her. And I said, Aneta, for your PhD dissertation, I'd like you to prove Hamilton wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. He made some mathematical mistakes. Yeah. So that's why. Uh, now, the, of course, now, 
now that we've proved how it's wrong, there's other things to be done. And, uh, and Dali is working on conservation democracy and conservation of endangered species, such as clearly very, very important from an evolutionary point of view. And other stuff we're doing too. Yeah. Do I have time for more questions? Yeah. Yeah, yes. Um, how, how long do you like, so chimpanzees and gorillas are occasionally um, kept in captivity yeah. in like sanctuaries. How long do they live there versus in the wild? So Dahlia Condon is an expert on this. And so she, uh, the World Zoos have formed an organization called Species 360. And Species 360 has gathered an enormous amount of data on how long different kinds of species live in zoos. Absolutely enormous amount. And Dahlia has accepted the job as director of research for Species 360 and associate professor here as well. And uh, so, uh, so she's compiling all these, uh, putting these data in a format that they can be used because it's, it's a massive amount of work. But uh, but you now have done this for mammals, right? Yes. For lots of species of mammals. Yes, actually, Lionel, we have extracted all, all the data, and actually we have a project in public health to exactly compare survival between different populations of primates. So exactly what Jim showed in the, the two lines of, of longevity, we had only one population of primates, of different species of primates. So the idea now is to compare different populations of one species of primates with others and see if we see the same, the same, the same trend, but using data from wild populations and data from the zoos that are controlled. And we, we have access to a lot of, we have 179 million medical records, and so we know when they were moved, if they were sick, all, all these type of, of data. So, so that's exactly the next the next project, and we're very very excited. So if you want to work on it, talk with Dolly. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I just want to know uh, uh, why do women uh, live longer than men? Is it because we are needed longer? We answer the phone when adults. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So six, seven years ago, Paul Christmas and I got a major grant from the US National Institute on Aging to study the, what's known as the health <coughs> paradox. And the paradox is that women in almost every population in the world, in fact all the national populations say women live longer than men. But at older ages, women are sicker than men. So, uh, so that basically you have suffering females and dead males. So, 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 helping us with this, and it's a real paradox. How can you live longer but suffer? And the, I, I didn't show the data, but we have data from Denmark, and the. Uh, Healthy life expectancy for men is a little bit higher than healthy life expectancy for women. The difference between male and female life expectancy is entirely due to the unhealthy years women live behind. So, so we're trying to figure this out. And uh, it's very complicated. So the uh, Virginia Zerulli, who's sitting behind you, has been working on this. And uh, she, uh, she decided to look at populations in which uh, mortality falls to a very, very low level. So population is in crisis. Uh, so when uh, mortality is, is a terrible crisis and life expectancy falls to three years, what happens to the male-female gap? Well, the women live four years and the men live two years. <laughs> so, so this has to be something biological. But, but also, uh, we know that men behave differently for women. And, uh, the, uh, the incredible stupidity of males has to play some role. So testosterone has to play some role somehow. So, but uh, we're trying to sort this out. But, uh, but it's a combination of biological and social factors. But, uh, the, uh, if men and women are put into an environment where they're not able to act real stupid, so for example in nunneries and monkeries, if they become nuns and monks, then life is about the same. Uh, and then the, in Germany, uh, life is actually about the same for nuns and monks, and then uh, for a long time, up until 1950 or so, and then they allowed the monks to smoke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so, so it's a combination of the environment and, so, and biology. 
I think unfortunately we are running out of time, but there might be more time for asking questions. Uh, I think there, there is actually more time to uh, to ask questions. If you turn, go out of this door, look at your left. There's a staircase. You go upstairs. There's some food. Good for survival. <laughs> There's a room. Is it balanced? <laughs> and uh, there you can you can actually uh, discuss among yourself and uh, with Jim and Jim. Thank you so much for this lecture. Fantastic. You get here a little bit of food. Sauce. I'll share it with you. It's chocolate. Yeah. Uh, and special. Here you have the famous uh, DLP yes. Curious yes. T-shirt. Yes. <laughs>